We often don't take much care of our environment and now we are feeling the effect of that. Here at Echo Africa, we'd like to highlight projects and initiatives that do things differently and better. A warm welcome to this week's edition. I am Chris Lemps in Lagos. Thank you, Chris. And yes, they are projects that really give us encouragement and hope, like our top story this week on greenhouse farming in Somalia. I am Sandra Twinoglio, coming to you from Kampala here in Uganda. And here is what else is coming up. How conservationists in the DRC are helping sea turtles to hatch and make it to the ocean. How a local waste recycling project in Senegal is improving lives in a suburb of the capital, Dhaka. And why there will be more electric buses on Nairobi's roads in the future. But first, water is life. So how can you survive when there is simply none of it around? In Somalia, the rainy season has failed three years in a row. It has affected a quarter of the population and more than half a million people are fleeing the drought. In the capital, Mogadishu, however, some farmers have found a way to keep vegetable production going. This, believe it or not, is a riverbed, now dried up and full of garbage. The Shabele River was once a key lifeline in Somalia. Its water supplied the agricultural areas near the capital. Grains, fruits and vegetables from Mogadishu came from this region. But climate change has pitched the country on the Horn of Africa into drought. The UN says it's the region's worst drought in 40 years. Farmer Sido Adan's entire livelihood is at stake. In the last three seasons, the drought has hit our farms badly. We had no crops at all. And the river dried up four months ago. There was no maize on the farm to feed our family. The devastating drought has already forced around 700,000 people from their homes. Many live in refugee camps like Hamdi Hussein and her children. I fled my farming village after the drought hit the last three seasons and we couldn't farm any crops. We had to leave because we didn't have any food for the children. Food prices are rising, driven in particular by Russia's war in Ukraine. That's making aid more expensive too. Even food destined for Somalia doesn't always arrive. There's a number of donors at the beginning, they already told us that some commodities are coming heading towards us. Those commodities were already diverted in the, in the sea, uh, heading to uh, Ukraine. So what can be done? These greenhouses on the edge of Mogadishu may be part of the solution, often financed with farmers' last savings or loans. Awe Abdi now grows tomatoes with groundwater. He needs much less water than before, thanks to drip irrigation and because there's less evaporation in a greenhouse. It was a risk that paid off. In the last three years, there was no rain on our farms and the river was completely dry. So I decided to move to greenhouses to plant our crops, although it was difficult at first to adapt to greenhouse technology. Abdirahman Sabrie, in contrast, embodies a new young type of farmer in Somalia. For him, greenhouses are not an emergency solution. He studied greenhouse farming at the Somali National University. His family then helped him get started with seed capital of $10,000. He says greenhouse farming produces more vegetables and more reliably. The great thing about greenhouses is that you can harvest all year round and you don't have to worry about the dry river or an absence of rain. As long as you have a small amount of water, you can plant any crops in it. 
They harvest here twice a week, picking a total of around 400 kilos of tomatoes, and they've taken on six employees. At the Hamarwene market in Mogadishu, the traders have a lot less fresh produce to offer because of the drought. Some of the gaps can be filled with greenhouse produce. These fruits and vegetables are often more fresh. We expect the rain to start again soon, but the river is still dry. There's no water in it at all. We get some fruits and vegetables from greenhouse farmers who sell to us at a very high prices, but we have no other way of getting fruits and vegetables. Greenhouses can't solve Somalia's food crisis, but they are an important addition. That's according to agriculture expert Abdul Kadir Shirwa. Food security. Greenhouses can contribute to food security in Somalia when the production of conventional farms is very low in the country, like it is at this time. The greenhouses produce a huge amount of fruits and vegetables, which can fill the gap in the market. They also contribute to Somalia's economy as well. About 50 farmers near Mogadishu are now growing vegetables in greenhouses. It's the best alternative as long as the Shebele River remains a dry wasteland. We moved from Somalia to its neighbor Kenya and from vegetable farming to big city mobility. A Kenyan startup has set out to revolutionize public transport with electric buses. An e-bus costs around four times as much as a diesel bus. A hefty sum for a company that wants to put a thousand of them onto East African roads over the next five years. But a start has been met. Our doing a bit this week comes from Nairobi. Nairobi is home to over 5 million people. Nearly 20,000 die every year from the poor air quality, according to the WHO. And the ubiquitous minibuses are huge carbon emitters. I think we're at that time where we can no longer turn a blind eye to the contribution of uh, transport-based carbon emissions to the environment. So Nairobi wants to run more electric vehicles in its public transport network. There are already two electric buses in operation. On a full charge, they can cover around 250 kilometers, enough for the whole day. Linus Bosire has been driving his new bus for three months now. There's no, uh, a lot of expenses in this bus, like uh, a diesel bus. For example, I used to do uh, a service every month. This one, you, you, you don't do any service. In time, tickets for the electric buses are set to be cheaper than the diesel ones. The bus can take 25 passengers. Internet is free and they can charge their phones at the same time. It has services that others can't provide. You feel relaxed and there's no noise. It's nice. The transport company only has one charging station right now. It takes up to four hours to charge the buses. The firm is also training engineers to work on the electric vehicles. The plan is to steadily increase the number of e-buses over the next five years, a key step towards better air quality in the Kenyan capital. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Getting to where you're headed safely is also the topic of our next report. Only one sea turtle in a thousand lives is able to reach adulthood. Many never even reach the water. Indeed, Sandra, those cute little creatures have many enemies. Seabirds, crabs and octopus all love to eat freshly hatched turtles. National Park Rangers in the Democratic Republic of Congo are giving a huge boost to their chances of survival. Yeah. 
A helping hand to cross the dangerous shore. Ranger Christian Ndombe carries these baby turtles right to the water's edge to make sure they get there safely. It's always special for him when they hatch. I like it when the babies come out of their nests. It makes me very happy. Since the end of October, Christian Ndombe and his colleagues have scoured the Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC's, mere 38 kilometers of beach for turtle nests. They took 50,000 eggs to an incubation center, where they were protected by wire mesh and mosquito nets. The baby turtles hatched after 50 days. The project is run by the country's Nature Conservation Authority. It protects the vulnerable creatures from the locals and birds. They both eat the eggs. This generation has survived, but future generations might not. Erosion often eliminates the coastline. We have a lot of threats from erosion. Rising sea levels and erosion have swept away over 55 meters of the beaches during the last 30 years. The park rangers estimate that almost a quarter of nesting sites have been destroyed. Now a new threat has emerged. Only a couple of kilometers along the coast, where the Congo River reaches the sea, DRC President Felix Chisakedi has laid the foundation for a new deep-sea port. The park rangers fear that the port means even more danger for the turtles' habitat. The Congolese Institute for the Conservation of Nature agrees and says it was not consulted by developers. As far as I know, there is no study about uh, uh, environmental and social impact. Uh, we need to see these uh, this studies uh, until now we don't have them. The new port will be built at the edge of a mangrove forest. It's a nature reserve where an enormous number of endangered plant and animal species thrive, including four turtle species, manatees and mudskippers. The head of African whistleblower protection platform, Gabriel Boudon Fatal, says the potential damage could be catastrophic. Mangroves are important because they stop floods. In a period of rapidly rising waters, we unfortunately don't know what effect the disappearance of the mangrove forests would have on the floods that could affect the Congolese Atlantic coast. The last few of the 300 turtles Christian Ndombe brought to the waterfront today are finally being carried out by the waves. In the years to come, we hope to see the baby turtles that are here today return when they're adults and then lay their eggs on our beach. And he hopes that when they return, they'll find their home beach is still a welcoming habitat. You couldn't exactly call the place we are going to in our next report a welcoming habitat. Illegal trash exports from Germany are creating toxic wasteland in Romania. It's a lucrative business for the waste mafia because disposal sites charge just a fraction of the cost in Western Europe. But Octavian Boxchenu from Bucharest is determined to track down the waste smugglers. Yet again, a case of arson at an illegal Romanian landfill. Octavian Bercianu was then head commissioner of Romania's Environmental Guard. He led the investigation. That was a year ago. A lot of garbage was burned here. For 20 minutes, there was a lot of smoke. Two more fires like that and the south of Bucharest would be engulfed in smoke and stench. In fact, all of Bucharest suffers from serious environmental problems. Several times in recent years, limits have been exceeded a hundred times over. The problem isn't just heavy traffic. There's also the repeated illegal burning of waste, some of which comes from Germany. Last summer, Romanian border police made a major discovery in the Black Sea port of Constanza, more than 1,800 tons of suspicious waste. The shipping documents showed it had been declared as plastic, but it also contained metal, tires, batteries 
and even carcinogenic asbestos. A dangerous mix that's prohibited by the EU. We want to confront the German company Mello with the accusations and head to Hamburg. It's home to Europe's third largest port. Each year, millions of containers are shipped from here. Some contain waste. We discover that Greenpeace also has been aware of Mello for some time. Over the phone, Melor says it doesn't want to comment. Ten days earlier, we'd sent an official press inquiry with no response. Then, suddenly, the manager appears. We hear about shipments from Melor found in Romania that are illegal. No. Yes, you're being prosecuted there. Nonsense. It's been cleared up. It's a mistake. Would you like to say that on camera? I'm not the right person to talk to. That is why we called you. No cameras. A few minutes later, the manager acknowledges the investigation, but says his waste shipments were legal. I know the Romanians are doing something, but they didn't analyze it. They glanced at it and thought, oh, there's some cable and a circuit board in there. But DW has seen the report on the waste, which the Romanian prosecutors had analyzed in a German lab. It shows the waste also contained undeclared toxic components. Back in Romania, we meet Octavian Barciano at the landfill again. He is no longer in uniform, he was released from office. Did his dismissal have to do with his efforts to stop garbage smuggling? These are structures of organized crime. They're shifting waste from countries like Germany, Britain, Italy, but also from Bulgaria and Romania itself. This waste sometimes travels thousands of kilometers to get here. The EU Commission says Germany is one of the most important markets for illegal waste disposal. Some of the waste goes to cement factories. Some contracts cover up the fact that much more waste is imported than these factories can burn for cement production. So the waste ends up being burned in fields. The investigation is being headed by prosecutor Theodor Nietzsche. The Hamburg case is just one of many examples of trash smuggling he's examining. He says the problem isn't just as honest business owners, but also corrupt politicians. In recent years, he's repeatedly called on the government in Bucharest to take action against trash smugglers. One minister's answer left me speechless. She said, we can't do it because it would anger the big cement producers and they have a strong lobby. He heads to the harbour for another inspection. I just got a call from the EU judicial authority about coordinating the case with Germany and Belgium. In Romania, charges have been filed against a Hamburg-based company. Now, the courts will decide whether Melor acted criminally or not. Since China banned the import of plastic waste in 2018, waste exporters are looking more and more to countries like Romania, Bulgaria and Poland. Germany is considered a world leader in recycling, but that's probably also thanks to the many waste exports to Eastern Europe. A similar situation to the one we've just seen in Romania is far too common in many countries in Africa as well. Take Senegal, for example. A lack of any efficient waste management system there means most waste never even make it to the landfills. That is true, Chris. Instead, it litters the landscape, the ocean, or generates toxic fumes when it gets burned in residential neighborhoods. But things are changing. In a seaside suburb of Dhaka, a new recycling concept has been put in place, and it is working. This isn't a common sight. Here in the Dhaka suburb of Fusk, a boy taking his empty plastic lemonade bottle out to a waste bin in the yard of his home. But the Bat family is taking part in a pilot project. Wow. 
Before, we used to throw everything into the sea. We had one bin and mix everything together and then chucked it out. It was simpler. Now, we have a different bin for plastic bottles, one for cans, another for food waste, all sorted into different piles. It's straightforward and everyone here knows what to do. Besides plastic, metal and paper, the family also separates organic waste. Every two weeks, the city picks it all up. The project is called ZEC, Zone Ecologique Communautaire, or Community Ecological Zone. Launched by the district authorities, it's the first of its kind in Senegal. Idrissa Tiao initiated ZEC in response to the worsening pollution problems in its neighborhood and along the coastline. We were mixing everything together and throwing it away if the truck didn't come. We really had to change people's mindset and get them to respect their environment and also help with waste recovery by explaining that waste is not something bad. Waste has become a resource. A resource this factory in Dakar's Diamniadio Industrial Zone is making the most of. It sorts the plastic and processes it into plastic pellets. The factory's manager says that as the recycling industry has taken off, plastic has gone from pollutant to money maker. On a national level, we see it increasing more and more every year. And now the state is putting in place a system to better control waste management logistics and plastic waste collection. There's lots of plastic waste outside Dakar as well, but no organized system. By decentralizing collection activities and using programs like ZEC, it helps industrialists like us get the material much more easily and at a lower cost. Without them, we'd have to organize our own collection system and go hunting for the recyclable materials in this region or other regions. It would be much more difficult for us. On this morning's round, waste collectors have picked up the pre-sorted trash of 80 families. In one year, they've collected two tons of plastic and over 80 kilograms of aluminium cans. The system works here in Refusk because the city learned from initial mistakes and now does more than simply distribute trash cans. At first, we put rubbish bins everywhere. But if you don't train people, there will always be bad people who take them for scrap metal and plastic. That's why locals have been trained. Today, you see rubbish bins in front of the houses and they'll be there for a hundred years. People now understand it's in their own interest to leave the bins where they are. However, it'll be a long time before waste separation and recycling becomes the norm across Senegal. With less than half of the population benefiting from any kind of waste collection initiatives, open dumping and burning are widespread methods of getting rid of household waste. City authorities here hope their project will set an example because the benefits are so obvious. There's no waste here by the sea now. You'll see it in other places where there's been no support, no ZEC. That's why we want to replicate the ZEC of Tualen everywhere in Refusk and export it to other regions of Senegal. That's a pretty ambitious goal. Senegal's cities generate 9,000 tons of waste every day, and the volume continues to rise. They're small and made of plastic, sachets. These little packets might be handy, but they quickly land in the garbage bin, and they don't rot. In our web special, we chart the journey of such a sachet from the origins of the raw materials it's made from to its end on the rubbish heap. We find out why the number of sachets is growing and why they're so lucrative for businesses and so disastrous for our planet. Find out more at dw.com plastic. And it is time for us to go already. I hope you enjoyed today's wonder through the environment. 
have certainly enjoyed taking you along with us. But for now, it is bye-bye. Until next week, I am Sandra Twinovidio, signing off from Kampala here in Uganda. I've also enjoyed it, Sandra. Thank you. Next week, we'll be back for you again. But between now and then, you can stay in touch on our social media channels with lots of new and eye-catching content. Till then, it's goodbye from Lagos, Nigeria.